Hey, what's up, everybody? Hey. Hey, happy 4th of July weekend, everybody. Why don't you do me a favor, and somebody nearby, just go ahead and salute them and say, we are all America. Go ahead and salute them. We are all America. We are all America. That's right. Hey, what's up online, people? I'll salute you. We are all America. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Carter. I'm the pastor around here, if we haven't met. And the pastor, when there's a pastor, they're there to help. So that's what I'm here to do today. I'm here to help us get into God's word. I believe it's going to help as we learn some things that God wants to talk to us about. And today we're going to talk about God's heart for the outcast and the forgotten and the person that doesn't feel like they fit in church circles or any other kinds of circles. We're talking about the outcast. I know sometimes in summer, um, it feels a little bit light. That's always how it is. Typically, I think we've had one summer that I didn't feel like that way in like 12 years. So, um, But I heard an illustration recently that I really like said that in summer, the church is kind of like the locker room, okay? This isn't, the, the spectators don't come in the summer. It's just the people that are there to huddle up and get in shape and get in training. And here's what I know is that by the end of the summer, if you haven't had one already, you'll probably have some kind of significant difficulty that you're gonna need Jesus' help with. And I found out that a little bit of Jesus helps a little and a lot of Jesus helps a lot. So uh, I wanna exhort you and encourage you and thank you for prioritizing Jesus, making this a big deal in your life. Oh, hey, there's a Bible right here. If you don't have a Bible and you are physically present, there's always Bibles right over here. You can just have them for free. No one's even gonna say nothing if you grab one. Even if you don't necessarily know, like, I don't know what to do with that, that's okay. Just take it anyway. Um, if you just open up, especially like right in the middle or in the latter fourth, there's something good in there that you will understand, I promise. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be back, man. I was away from the church last weekend and I like to go visit other folks, and, and, and that's great, but I really like my own people. I like your amens. Your amens, maybe it's just like, you know, it's, it's like your mom's lasagna is better than anybody else's. Like, my people's amens are better than anybody else's amens. So, um, hey, uh, a month from now-ish, there is a, what do we call it, the, the family festival? The, it's, it's a long word, man. Back to school family festival on August 7th, but you can see it there. It's, there's going to be food, treats. Bounce houses, baptisms, this is right after church, and this is going to sneak up on us, okay? So back to school starts way earlier than anybody feels like it does. So we're going to start on August 7th. We, we want to either fill or fund backpacks for uh, local kids going back to school, but then we're also going to make it a lot of fun for us. We're going to have inflatables and have a whole lot of fun. It's kind of like a big doggone church picnic that, could, that you get to invite people to, and we're giving stuff away. So I want to encourage you. It's going to happen fast. It's like, it's going to feel like summer's not even like really over, but it kind of almost is. So we're just going to do it right on the 7th. I want to encourage you to be there. We're going to have a lot of fun. And now we're going to talk about how the fact that <clears throat> here's what Jesus comes to do. Jesus sees potential in everybody. And he comes to forgive. He comes to erase guilt. And he comes to free from the pressures and expectations and really uh, suffocation that the world brings to us. You've probably, if you're anything like me, you've been in a place where you felt out of place. You felt like, I don't know, I, I did this wrong. I don't know how I got here. I feel like I didn't bring the right book to the study thing, or I don't have the right clothes for what I showed up at. People told me it was different, and now I show up, and it's a it's different thing than I thought. Or you figure like, oh, I thought it was going to be this way when I got to that off-site saying, and now I realize I'm completely underprepared. You know what this is like, right? You've been into a place where you're like, I feel like I'm a little bit on the edges or on the outskirts. Or maybe like me, you've, you've even showed up to places where you were kind of a little bit excluded, like you were away from the group. There was Everybody else kind of had this thing in common, and maybe you didn't have that thing in common. And so it was hard for people to connect with you, hard for you to connect with people. Whatever it is, you know what that's like. And What's really tragic is sometimes it's like that in church circles. Sometimes people don't feel quite at home. They don't know, I don't know if I, I feel, you know, like I'm, I'm off-putting to people or people are off-putting to me. And, and, and sadly, they don't know how necessarily to relate in church environments. And sometimes life gets bad enough that they're like, ah, I don't care, I need, I need to do something. So a few months back, a gal showed up at our front door at like 9 a.m. I had a meeting uh, with somebody else here at the church, and we met up, and, and she was in trouble. And I won't tell you the kind of trouble particularly she was in, but she was she was sweet, sweet gal. And she clearly was just like, I don't, I don't know what to do here. I just know I need help. And it was it was it was like super sweet, super, but for her, you could tell awkward, and she felt kind of like other. Uh, and so you know, we did did our best to to 
take care of her and, and, and got her patched up. And she, she felt so good walking out, I think, at the end of our time together. But I, I remembered what it's like. Oh, not everybody feels like, like this is natural to them. And so if it doesn't feel natural for you, can I just tell you, you're in good company. We're going to talk about a girl today. She felt completely out of context. She felt like I'm in the, nobody here wants me here except maybe one guy. And that guy was Jesus. And we're going to learn some lessons from her courage. But for those of you who might be listening later on or tuning in later on, I want to give some context of where we are in history right now, okay? So less than a week and a half ago, a decision came down from the Supreme Court that Roe v. Wade was essentially struck down, okay? That means now, unlike before, it's, uh, it's not mandatory that every state has to provide state-funded abortions, okay? That's a big deal. That affects a lot um, here. And so we're talking about that freshly right now. Maybe in the future, you're all talking about it's completely moved, but right now, that's what we're talking about. And so there's a lot of things to talk about. And, and sometimes it's taboo to talk about that in church, but there's, there's, there's a sign out there that says fear. So we're going to talk about it um, for us today. But uh, we might be going a little different direction than you think, because um, I want to talk about maybe the outcast, maybe the person that even gets forgotten about in the context of an abortion conversation. And I don't want to be real political with you, honestly, because I'm going to talk to you more theologically, and my theology predates all the political stuff, okay? This, we're going to talk 3,000-year-old truth claims from God, okay? So um, we're going to talk about that today. But I also don't want, want you to feel adversarial with me because I'm not adversarial with you. You, you know, Fierce is the kind of place you can come here and you don't have to agree with everything the preacher says or anybody says. Like, you can just be where you are, and you can open up your heart and see where Jesus meets you today. And it is not a thing here where everybody has to agree about all the things, but it is a thing where we're going to talk about all the things, and you get to weigh, and you get to decide, and you get to see what you, in your personal relationship with God, um, what kind of things you come to. But I definitely want to make the case that Jesus cares about moms. Jesus cares about moms, um, all moms, but especially maybe moms that don't feel like they fit. They don't feel like, well, you, you know, like I, I, I try to fit in with like the pro-choice people and yet there's something about because maybe they had an abortion and they're like, but I don't resonate with what is being claimed over here. Because the truth is that like they're afraid to say it, but they're like, I'm really conflicted about this. Because maybe I had an abortion, but I don't feel great about it. And I even feel like a little bit like I was tricked on some levels or I feel like I'm supposed to be celebrating something that I do have guilt about. And I don't know if I'm supposed to like, be at the parades or if I'm supposed to be thinking something else, but I just don't quite resonate. But then I go over to the church people and I feel like I'm not quite on board with them. And I don't know, like they just seem really convinced about some things. And, and I don't know if that's right because the whole world is saying something else. And so I don't really know what to think about it. And maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe you are somebody like that. And can I just tell you, you have my compassion. And I think there's a special place for you in today's conversation because Jesus is really concerned about the person that doesn't feel like, I don't feel like I fit anywhere. That's who's on Jesus' heart. So we're going to crash right into this party. There's a party going on. I've preached on this party probably two or three times in my preaching career. But I'm really excited about this one because it's one of my favorite things to preach on. And I feel like every time I preach on it, I get more gooey into it. So here we go. What you got to know is that Jesus is, by this time, he's a very public figure, okay? People know who he is. And life was more public then, okay? So um, when there was somebody who was kind of like famous in your city, uh, it was okay. If, if they were at a party, the, the house would be wide open, and people that weren't really invited to the party could still go and kind of look in the windows. In the show, The Chosen, there's a really great depiction of this, okay? So like, uh, Jesus is with his disciples and he's in the house of Zebedee and there's like all these open windows and people are just like coming up to the window and like talking to him and you're like, what is happening here? Why are people just poking their head through the windows? Well, that was a common way to do it. It was, was kind of like, oh, it was listening to somebody else's conversation. You couldn't necessarily just butt into the conversation, but you could listen, especially maybe if you're from like at a little different social status or what have you. So it's, it's kind of like the way we today, we like to listen to podcast interviews. Like you're not contributing to that at all, but you, you like listening to someone else talk about the stuff. That's kind of what's happening here. So lots of people listening to Jesus at this party of Simon the Pharisee, and they're talking about stuff. But what we need to know is that one of the people that's just on the outskirts of this party, she definitely feels like she doesn't belong. And most of the people there would feel like she doesn't belong. And she, the, the text tells us she must have had some kind of an encounter with Jesus earlier because she's very captivated and convicted by the fact that he has forgiven her and valued her in ways that nobody else has. He has affirmed her 
and he's honored her, and she doesn't quite even totally understand how this can be, but she's going to crash the party here in just a minute. So we'll pick it up in verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. So he went to the Pharisee's home and took his place at the table. There was a woman who was a notorious sinner in that city. Okay, so people know who this girl is, right? She, she has a reputation. People are like, oh, I know her. When she learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's home, she took an alabaster jar of perfume, probably the most expensive thing she had. She knelt at, at his feet behind him. She was crying, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. Then she kissed his feet over and over again, anointing them constantly with the perfume. So she's, she's looking for him. And, and it, we can infer, most scholars would write this, she's probably a prostitute, okay? Like, she's not... You're only known for so many things when you're kind of a bad girl, okay? And so, like, she's notorious. People all over the city know her. That, that's possibly, probably what her, you know, her deal is. But she goes and, and she grabs a really expensive gift that she wants to bring to Jesus. And she, you know, can you picture her there? She, she's, she's on the outskirts and she, she's trying to, to move in. And I think there's certain things, like, firing in her brain. Some of them being... She can see that, okay, normally when, when a guest, especially a guest of honor, would go to another ho- house, a servant would come and wash the guest's feet. Now, Simon the Pharisee did not have anybody do that for Jesus. So I wonder if there's a little bit of indignation. She's like, do you even know who you're dealing with in there? Do you even know like, who you've got in there? And so she, she knows, like, I don't belong here. I, I don't know, but I need to get to him. And I've, I've, I'm, I'm gripped to the, soul, to the core of my being of who he is. And, and you know, can you just picture? She's just breaking in. She's breaking in there. And she finds Jesus, and he's there. He's, he's lounging at the table. Okay, so this, this would have been a little table about this high. And people, you know, they're like sitting down, or they're kind of lying down, or they're, they're eating there at the table. And she breaks in, and she falls before his feet. And she's like, well, I, I don't have like a, a basin or something, you know, like a servant who would wash his feet would have. And she's got the tears anyway because she's so gripped by Jesus, and she just begins to weep. And, but she doesn't have a towel either, and she can't, she can't dry, dry his feet, so she just... She's like, well, I got, this, I got this hair. And so she pulls her hair down. And I ain't gonna lie, it's a little weird that she pulls her hair down. It's not weird to us at all. But in her deep sense of repentance, she pulls her hair down. And in that culture, that was a sensual thing to do. Okay, so it's, it's awkward. This party crasher is awkward. Like, what is she, what is she doing? And, and some of you know, I, I've said this before, it's a little bit like today if someone who was so like, they didn't know what to do and, and, and some gal, she's like, oh, I, I need to mop something up and I don't know what to do. So she just pulls her shirt off. And there she is in her bra. And she, what, what's ironic about this is, you know, this, this, this Pharisee is gonna think, well, this chick is evil and he should know that. And maybe some other people are, you know, thinking that in their brains. And yet she's actually doing it very innocently. And she's actually the one who's honoring him the most. But it's, it, it feels awkward to everybody but it's actually like kind of like the most appropriate thing to do. She's awkward about it, but she's like, un- this, dude, this dude is not getting enough honor. He's not getting enough honor. And I don't know why you, y'all, you know, nimrods aren't doing anything right now, but I see who he is. And so fine, I'll, I'll take care of it then. That's what I'll do. And she probably, maybe she felt the awkwardness of people around her, maybe like you and I, we feel the awkwardness. You're, you're visualizing something in the store and it's happening and it's awkward and everybody knows, hey, I saw something in the airport a couple weeks ago and it was clearly a scene and everyone around was like, let's all pretend that didn't happen. That was really weird, you know, and we all just kind of pretend and went on with our thing. Um, and I, I imagine that's how she's feeling right now. Now, you know what the world would say? Our world today, right now, our world would probably get involved in that. And say, I'll tell you what, there's nothing wrong with her. I don't know why everyone feels so awkward. She should just be who she is. Look, this is the profession she's chosen, and this is fine, and y'all are misogynist and hateful toward her. And they would not be in agreement with Jesus, at least, okay? Because Jesus actually doesn't agree with her lifestyle. He's corrected her about her lifestyle, and she agrees with his correction. And so we just got to see where is, where is our generation out of sync with Jesus? Well, our generation says everybody just be free and do whatever you want. And, and, you know, who are you to correct anybody? Well, Jesus is somebody and he corrects her. And he corrects her about something very specific about her past. Now, 
I'm going to talk for a second about abortion. And here's what I'm not going to do. I am not going to rant. I don't think it's helpful. I think most of you would agree with a rant anyway. And those of you who wouldn't don't want to hear me rant. I think I'm going to give you an anti-rant instead. I want to talk to you like I would talk to, I've got four daughters between the ages of 14 and 21. It's definitely on my mind what they think about things like abortion. And so what I want to do is I want to appeal to you from the scriptures. This is not, and I mean this in the sweetest way, but this is not for the world, okay? This is for people I care about. And I want you to know what the scriptures say. If this is not for the public square of social media, I don't care. What I care about is the people I care about. And this book, the Bible, and people making some decisions, they can, they can, they can every one of them can look at this and say, what, what do I think about this? But I just want to make the appeal so that you hear the real appeal and not just like the caricature of the appeal. Does that sound okay? Let's start with this presupposition. What the world does, the world hears God's law and it says, I don't like that. Tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to erase it. I'm just trying to get rid of it. Then I don't have to think about it. I don't have to feel anything about it. The problem is you can't erase it because it's still written on people's hearts. People still feel the law written on their hearts. They feel like I did something wrong even though everybody, even though six billion people are telling me it's right, it still feels like somebody else is telling me it's wrong. So the world is gonna try to sponge it away. And here's, here's, here's the irony is the world misses all the joy of knowing what it is to be a forgiven sinner. See, and see this, is, this is the Bible's perspective. Don't try to get rid of the law. Just admit that you broke it. Let Jesus forgive you and pay the price that must be paid for that breaking of the law. But then you get to enjoy his delight and his friendship and his celebration. And you get to feel perfectly safe in the arms of God who is never going to reject you even though you broke his law. That is, that is incredibly the best news in the universe. And that is what um, the gospel is all about. And that's really what God would have us understand about this. So let's learn some things about how the Bible sees humankind. Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart for my holy purposes. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now he's talking specifically to Jeremiah, but he's also talking about humankind. And what, what I need us to see here is that before he was even formed in the womb, God had a purpose for Jeremiah. What that means is there's a purpose first, then they're in the womb. See, what we say is, hey, man, well, you know, hopefully if they survive the womb and they, they get it through, then maybe, okay, now they, they get out of the birth canal and now there's, maybe now there's a purpose, like ching signed a purpose right there. And God says, no, the purpose predated the conception. I already had the purpose. The purpose is what caused the conception to happen because I have a purpose I want to bring about through it. Here's Psalm 139, starting in uh, verse 13. You alone created my inner being. You, talking to God, knitted me together inside my mother. I will give thanks to you because I've been so amazingly and miraculously made. Your works are miraculous, and my soul is fully aware of this. My bones were not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, when I was being skillfully woven in an underground workshop. Your eyes saw me when I was only a fetus. Every day of my life was recorded in your book before one of them had taken place. Meaning, when inside the womb, this child was already an active project. It wasn't just like, God's like, well, tell me when it's done, ding, like the microwave goes off. No, there's an intimate relational involvement of like, oh man, I got plans for this one. This is gonna be good. I can't wait for this one to fulfill their purpose. Now, the other side of that that we've also got to know is in the world of the Bible, there is a real enemy. He's all over the place. He's not omnipresent like God, but he's got messengers all over the place. And we can't see him most of the time, but you can see him in the things that he does. You can see him by the things he tries to talk us into. When people are being talked into suicide, most of the time, I believe, just having been around suicidal folks and exploring things of demonic nature, that's most often demonic. Like there's a demonic component to that. Anytime murder's involved, there's a demonic component to that. And there is a hater of life. His name is the devil. And he's out to destroy all human life. And he doesn't want people to really have time to think about it, okay? That's why sometimes there's so much pressure on gals to have an abortion. Hey man, don't think about it. 
Don't, don't come in here and look at, look at an ultrasound of this thing. Look, hey, the best thing to do is just ASAP, as soon as you possibly can, let's just get rid of this thing. And that is because the devil wants us in haste. Don't get wisdom. Don't think about it. Don't explore any more options. Don't think about what else might be. Just do it and do it now. Jesus talking about him says, for you are children, talking to these religious people that had gone astray, you're children of the, your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. My friends, the devil is springing lies on our planet constantly. Now, you don't have to agree with that. You just have to understand that's what this book claims, that there's more than just humans going on. There's other darker forces trying to manipulate humans and essentially just get them to think their ways. And here's an example. Now, this is a little bit older article. It's from 2015. But it, it, it's such an example, this is in salon.com, of the murderous rationale that one follows once you start down this road. Here's a gal, okay, she's writing an editorial, and she's saying essentially, look, man, I know that a fetus is a human life. I totally know that. It's still my call whether or not I want to kill it. Here's what she says. Yet I know that throughout my own pregnancies, I never wa wa wavered for a moment in the belief that I was carrying a human life inside of me. I believe that's what a fetus is, a human life. And that doesn't make me one iota less solidly pro-choice. All life is not equal. Let me say that again on 4th of July weekend. All life is not equal. That's a difficult thing for liberals like me to talk about, lest we wind up looking like death panel loving, kill your grandma and your precious baby stormtroopers. Yet a fetus can be a human life without having some rights as the women in whose body, it's the same rights as the women, woman in whose body it resides. She's the boss. Her life and what is right for her circumstances and her health should automatically trump the rights of the, of the non-autonomous entity inside of her always. Mary Elizabeth Williams. Yeah, that's, that's Nazi Germany. If that's the rationale, okay, if, if it's dependent on you, if it can't really live apart from you, what are you going to do with people that are handicapped enough? What are you going to do with people that are just, and they're just old and they're just taking up space now and they're just sucking people dry monetarily? And like, where, where do you stop that now? If, if it's really just about your, what's helpful to you because you're the superior life form. Let me say that again. You are the superior life form. I'm not saying everybody thinks this. I'm just saying this is a bold and brazen, murderous rationale example. Hey, man, here's what we'll just take off the table. Everybody's not equal. They're subhumans. And if, if they're subhumans, you can just kill. Dude, you can kill subhumans. What are you, nuts? Of course you can. Well, even so, I'm just making the appeal. Eight weeks in, those little humans can suck their thumbs. They can respond to sounds. They can recoil from pain. All their organs are already formed. They have a fingerprint. Their liver is already producing blood cells, and they have a heartbeat. Now, I, I just like, I like when the, the conversation is clear, okay? And I feel like oftentimes those forces of darkness, they try to muddy everything and make it unclear. And so you've heard this, and, and, and I think there's, there, these, are, these are great questions to ask. What about the hard cases? What about, hey, man, it was a result of rape or incest or there's something else going wrong? Fair question. Let's talk about those. Okay, so um, here are our stats from 2020. These are the hard cases, okay? Here, here we go. Of all the, the abortions performed in the United States, now this was then, 1.14% are done to save the life or physical health of the mother. 1.28% are to preserve the mental health of the mother. 0.39% are for cases of rape or incest. 0.69% are for fetal birth defects or eugenics. All that added up is all the hard cases. That's 3.5%. So, yeah, let's talk about the hard cases, but can we just remember, that's 3.5% of all of them? 3.5%? That means all the others are about one of two things. They're about social or economic reasons for the mom. Hey, man, like, and, and, and I'll give you some examples of what they are. Inadequate finances, not, not ready for responsibility. Women's life would be changed too much. Problems with relationships, unmarried. Too young or too immature. Children are grown, I don't want any more kids. Let's pretend, let's go two weeks out. Let's say that there's a baby there two weeks after birth. 
And let's say, which one of these qualifies, which is a good reason to kill the baby? Okay, inadequate finances. Kill the baby? Not ready for responsibility. Okay, so kill the baby? Women's life would be changed too much. Great, so now kill the baby? How about um, too young and immature? Okay, hey, good reason. Should we now kill the baby? No, it's, it's two weeks. It's the same child. The, the point is, when, when do you kill the baby? You don't kill the baby. That's the point. You don't kill the baby. Um, here's why. Because, I, and I, know, I, I, dude, I, like, I know it. And, and again, you don't have to, this is friendly. You don't have to agree with me, okay? I'm not trying to, like, I'm not trying to have that moment with you. Gotcha. I'm trying to just give us things to think about, okay? What about, hey, man, um, it's, it's my body, my rights. Totally makes sense. And when it is literally only your body, that's a different conversation than the one that we're having. Because in this conversation, there's two bodies. There's two heartbeats. There's two sets of fingerprints. There's two strands of DNA. There is two uh, brave waves that are already, sets of brain waves that are already happening. There's two. There's often two sets of blood types. Now, again, this is not a thing you, you need to maybe decide about on 4th of July. I just want you to have maybe a picture that isn't quite so out there and in everybody's face. I just want you to think about that because the world has lost its mind. The world has lost its mind. I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm not just talking about this. I mean, I'm just thinking about your own past three years. The world has lost its mind. And all I'm trying to suggest is there's some ancient paths over here and they lead to life. And I, I just invite you, let's just walk together for a while. You can leave it if you want to. Um, you can walk for six months and then leave, but you could also just walk with us for a little while. So now let's jump back to home girl. Let's jump back to the gal that was breaking in to the party, okay? She is already very convinced. Even though we all have done different things wrong, she's convinced the things that I did, it's, it's not legitimate to say it wasn't wrong. It was wrong in her mind. And she's breaking in and she's trying to get to the, her, her one hope. And, and maybe there's hope in this other guy. Maybe this Simon the Pharisee. He's supposed to be a religious professional, right? Maybe he'll help her. Maybe he'll be like, oh, well, look at this. Hey, hey, come on in, come on. You, you come right up in here. Here's Jesus. I'm sure he'd love to see it. But that's not what the religious professional does. The religious professional, he's, he's turned off. He's like, oh my gosh, are you, what are you, serious? What are you doing here? Why is she here? And he even starts to think bad about Jesus. And we're not gonna walk through his part of the narrative right now. You can study that on your own if you like. But he's like, oh, I can't even believe he doesn't know how bad she is. And then Jesus gives him a clever little riddle. And essentially the point of the riddle is, um, hey, Pharisee friend, here, here's, here's the difference between both you and the girl. It's not your sin. It's that she knows she needs mercy and you don't know. She knows she needs mercy and you don't know. She was incredibly courageous. She was incredible. I mean, can you imagine what she's feeling like? She's probably filled with, she's filled with the same shame. I mean, she knows everybody's eyes are on her. She's probably filled with grief. She's probably filled with like feeling of rejection. Probably every, you know, if, if not literally all the people there, probably at least the enemy was in her, her ear saying, you don't belong here. These people don't want you here. What are you doing here? And I think that's the same thing that he tells a lot of folks. These people don't want you here. So even if you don't have any ill will toward anyone who you know, maybe feels bad about themselves or they've done some things wrong that they're not totally at peace with, even if you don't feel any will, ill will toward them, there's a great chance the enemy is helping them think you do. And so my friends, this is where it comes back to us. And here's my question. And I'm, I'm really like stumped by this. Where are the disciples? What are they doing? Because I know they're in the narrative before this and I know they're in the one after this. And I know there had to be some of them there because this got recorded. So I'm like, where are the disciples? Where are you, Peter? Where are you, John? What are you doing right now? Are you just watching? Are you watching this poor girl have to break in? This poor girl who has so much courage. She's on her own and she's got to bust through because what, he, what they should have been doing, and this is where, yeah, you had a blind leader, but y'all had, so had these blind disciples who should have known better. Here's what they should have done. And this is us, okay? We're, they're, they're the everyman, okay? They're us right now as we're talking about it. What they should have been doing is being like, 
Here she comes. Well, this is why he came. They should have been grabbing suckers and whipping them out of her way. They'd be like, get out of here, man. Move, move, move. Here she comes. He came to seek and to save lost. This is his prize. This is his joy. This is why he's here. Move it. She's trying to get to him. But there's just silence. And here's the question of the day. I mean, this is the point. Is there silence from us? Are we moving? Are we chucking suckers out of the way? Because we should be. Like, we should never get so excited about what we do in here that we forget that primarily what's on Jesus' heart right now is her. So it's, it's halfway through. I mean, we're, this is the beginning of the sermon, but here's the bottom line. If the distant, the ashamed, and the outcast aren't on your heart, you're missing the weightiest thing on God's. If the distant, the ashamed, and the outcast aren't on your heart, you're missing the weightiest thing on God's. I mean, you've heard this before, but dude, I got five kids. And if one of them just didn't come home one night, I'd start to worry. And then if it went a little too much longer and we didn't hear from them, I'd start to really get worried. And if Kenji just said, hey, we got four more, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'd be like, babe, I feel like we're not in sync about what is important right now, okay? I like the other four, but one is missing, Okay? And so this is what we, we, we've got, our, because churchy people, man, we just, this is the way we go to church. You know, we, we just go, we go, we go, and we forget, dude, there is, that girl is out there, and she feels weird about being here. And so before she comes here, often it's way more helpful to get her to us, and we can be that extension, and we can throw some things in our own life out the way to get to her, because this is, this is what Jesus does, man. Jesus sees her potential. Jesus wants to bring life. But often, we ourselves are in the way. Verse 44, then turning to the woman, he told Simon, he said, do you see this woman? I came into your house. I like, watch what Jesus is gonna do here. I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but this woman washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman, from the moment I came in, has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with perfume. So I'm telling you that her sins, as many as they are, have been forgiven. Whoa, that's a big statement right there to say in front of everybody. Because everybody there knows only God forgives, can forgive the sins of somebody else. Have been forgiven. And that's why she has shown such great love. She shows great love because she got to him. She got to Jesus. She met him before this. And she's showing this great love in response to the love that he showed her. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Let me ask this question. Do you remember, for those of you who at one time you can remember when you were not in Christ, you were not a part of the spiritual family, you didn't know the forgiveness of Jesus. Do you remember that? Do you remember what that was like? Do you remember what it was like to be on there and not really get it? Not really get that you were forgiven? Not, not, did you, did, do you remember what it was like when you finally grasped the son of God, the king of the universe, thought it was worth leaving royal heaven and coming to me to find me and then die in my place just so he could have little old dopey me. Do you remember how that feels? To find that out? See, if we forget that, if we forget what it's like to not be in, if we forget what it's like to be the outsider, well, friends, we're gonna forget what all this is for. We gotta regularly meditate on what was it like before this? And this is the gospel. So Jesus honors her. I mean, that's what's happening. He's, that's the gospel right there. Jesus, Jesus is honoring her. The chick who ripped her shirt off. No, she didn't really, but you know what I'm saying. Whipped her hair out. She's, he's honoring her in front of all these religious professionals. He's saying, I'll tell you what I like. I like this. And that is the gospel because Jesus knows everything that you and I did wrong and yet he stands up and he says, let me tell you what I like. See, I already paid for all their sins. I already covered all that. And here's all the awesome ways I see them responding to my forgiveness. That is the gospel. The gospel is Jesus loves you so much. He throws his crown away and he says, whatever it takes, I'm gonna come no matter how much it costs me, no matter how much it hurts, I see their potential and I'm going to get on the cross and you gotta, we, we gotta get this. Lord, help us, help us get it. Think of the life Jesus could have had on earth without going to the cross. He lived forever, he never sinned. 
He could have set up all the kingdoms of the world exactly how he wanted. Now, he wouldn't have bought you. Your sin wouldn't have been covered. But he could have had anything and everything right here on earth. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus, in climbing up on the cross, he aborted himself so that you wouldn't be aborted out of heaven's plan. See, if he, if he doesn't go on the cross, you're just like, hey, you did betray God, though. So out you go. See, you are a traitor. So why shouldn't God just let you go? Just keep you from eternal life. Just let you float out into chaos, destruction, and hell. Why shouldn't he do it? I mean, you did all the bad things that you've done, right? Why shouldn't God do it? And Jesus says, I'll tell you what, instead of aborting them, Father, let's abort me. Abort me. I'll be cut short, even for their abortions. I'll do it so that they don't have to be aborted, so they can be welcomed into the true life that the Father has for them. And this lady, she's so full of courage that she busts through. It makes my soul weep to think of all the people that that day they just didn't have. They wanted to come to Jesus. They wanted to come find you. They wanted to talk to you about your God, but they just didn't have the courage and it was too hard and they were too tired and they were too sad and they just couldn't do it. They didn't have the courage and we weren't looking. We weren't looking. Our eyes weren't open. We weren't saying, who here? God, show me, show me, show me, show me. Show me who needs help. Show me who's in trouble today. So a couple weeks back, I was, I was coming out of the gym and this, I should, I should give you the, the prelude. I had been praying, Lord, show me people who need help. I just, show me people who, I'm not very smart. And I often just miss it, Lord. So show me some people who need help. And I'm coming out of the gym and I'm sitting there in my car kind of getting, you know, getting all the things ready to go. And um, gal just comes up on my car and she looks like she's in trouble. She looks like she needs help. You know, and I don't know what kind of day she'd had or frankly years that she'd had, but she looked like, okay, she... She's undercared for as a human, you know. Now, that might be some of her own decisions. That certainly is the first thing that goes through my mind. Um, but I'm like, I think, I think this is it. I think the Lord's sending me to help here. And she's asking for money. And she says, hey, you know, if you just give me a couple, couple bucks for gas. And now I've been around long enough. I'm like, well, here's the thing. If I give you money for gas, first, I don't carry cash. But second, um, if I do... I don't want to judge by appearances, but I also know, I've just seen other people, they're just not really going to use it what they say it for. So I'm like, I'll tell you what, why don't you follow me over to Meyer and I'll fill up your tank. Like, we'll just, we'll just take care of it. Now she's driving this big old, big truck, okay? <laughs> so it's going to take, it's going to take a little, it's going to take a bit of sitting there at the pump. Um, and she just begins to crumble right there. And she, she's like, I can't, I can't believe it. Yes, please, please. Okay. And so, and so we, she follows me over and and then we're there, and so you know, I, I get out, and I'm popping it in. And I'm honestly, I'm not even really thinking much about it. I'm just like, cool, I get to help somebody. You know, like, this is fun. Like, God's answering my prayer. And so she's like, oh, okay, you know, that, you know, that's good. And I'm like, no, we're filling it up. Like, you're, you got places to go. Let's, let's, let's go all the way. And she's like, oh, that's going to be over $100. And I'm like, I just feel the presence of the Lord right there. And I'm like, this is from Jesus. Jesus wants you to be able to get around. He cares about you. And she starts to cry. She's like, I talk to Jesus all the time. And I pray that he just, you know, sends me help. And here you are doing this. And then she's like, what, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm a preacher. She's like, oh, you're a preacher. And, and, <laughs> and but it, like, that's convicting to her. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not a big deal to me, but it's a, it's, it's a big deal to her. Like God sent her a preacher to fill her tank. And there's no credit that I get because it truly was Jesus's desire to help this lady. And she's, and you know, you could tell she felt awkward. You could tell it was like, I don't, I don't know how to break into this entirely. And you know what I found out? I was, I was reflecting a little later of like, what are the common denominators? When God sends me someone to help, what usually, some, that I'm supposed, he wants me to help, what's usually going on? Number one, they need help. Number two, it's in some sense inconvenient for me to do it. Like my schedule is in the way. I'm like, I, I'm, I schedule things tight, man. You know what I'm saying? And so there's some kind of like interruption where God is saying, not your thing, my thing. So there's those two, those two going on. And then there's some level of God asking me to honor them. 
honor them. So I just sat there for a couple minutes and I just spoke into her and, and spoke life to her and told her God loved her. And then she starts to tell me about her family, you know, her family background and like her religious history. And she's talking about like the different churches she's gone to. And I just said, I just grabbed her hand and said, you got Jesus, all right? Jesus is it. It's not religion. It's not any of that stuff. Like, that's great, but it's by faith in Christ. Jesus sent me. Jesus is for you. Jesus is the one who cares about you. Jesus is the one who's taking care of you right now. And she's like crying. She's like, yes, yes, yes. And so I pray with her. Like, she asked me to pray with her. She reminded me. Like, I think that had a much greater impact on me than it did on her. Because she reminded me of this woman who's trying to break in. Because honestly, I think she'd be uncomfortable coming here. Like just with the way, you know, she's taken care of. She just, she, I, I, I think there's a lot of situations that you and I are normally in that she wouldn't even go in because just the way her appearance was. But I thank God, and I'm asking him more frequently now. Now send me people like that. Send me people you want me to help. Now he doesn't send me people that I, you know, like he, when someone needs surgery, he doesn't send them to me. You know what I'm saying? Like it's things that I can actually do something about. If they need surgery, I'm like, let's find a stick here. I don't know, man. I don't know what to do. It's people that there's some way that I can be personally helpful in that. But, but I tell you this on 4th of July weekend because I want to remind you, there's people who really feel like they're on the outside and they're pray, they are praying. They're not here. They're not in church. They probably haven't read a Bible in 10 years, but they are praying and they're asking God for his help and they're asking God for his guidance and God's answer is you and me. God's answer is you and me, and I am dead serious. I don't mean literally, but I mean figuratively. We are grabbing suckers, and we're whipping them out the way, and we're saying, here comes the woman of honor. Here she comes. This is why Jesus died on the cross. This is what he wants. Let her in. Get to her whatever you gotta do. So, maybe it's people in your life that are really wild. <laughs> maybe it's someone in a different social strata than you. Whatever it is, here's what I wanna challenge us today. dude. Ask God for open eyes to see and to honor and invite them in. There's room for one more. And if we don't get this, it may be that we don't really, whatever else God's doing in our lives, if we don't get this, we may not get God's heart at all. Let's bow our heads. Hey, God, we want to admit um, there's so much that's out of our control and there's so many opportunities that we miss and none of us are perfect. We stumble in many ways. We get it wrong. We, we need grace. So we definitely know, uh, we know what it's like to receive it. We're asking for extra grace to give it and to see it where it's necessary. God, there's women and men and children that you love that the world has forgotten about, that the world is ignoring or avoiding and they don't know the things. They don't know the etiquette. They don't know how to do the things. And yet you're asking us to get over that and reach those you love. So we pray as a church, God, would you, would you fill our tank with this? Would you help us to go after the ones that maybe we feel a little bit uncomfortable in that situation, but not more than them and help us to do it boldly in Jesus' name.